everyone to our first 3D printing webinar of 2021. Um, if you joined us this last year on all of our webinar ventures, some of these might be repeats for you, but we're just going to do a quick recap, recap of what we actually broadcasted to you in 2020. So we're going to take a look at our top 3D printing moments of 2020. So we'd like to introduce you to our team. This is our Mark Forge MLC CAD systems teams. We've got myself, Amelia Parada. Um, we got Jordan Swan out of Atlanta. And then we've got Kyle Norman out of Dallas, Texas. That's who's going to be presenting today. And this is going to be a live feedback. So you get to um, interact with us personally. We also have three other members of the team. Um, China Penne out in Washington, Travis Bates also in Dallas, and then Chris Cummings also in Dallas. That is our technical staff. As well. So for the agenda today, we're going to take a look at five different webinars that we broadcasted in 2020. And we're going to review some of those um, opportunities that we got to talk to, to you about our technology. And then later on in the presentation, we're going to take a look at 22, 2021 predictions materials, software, hardware, and where the additive manufacturing market is going to go. So let's go ahead and get started. The first webinar that we're going to review is Mark Forge, the future of additive is now. So with the Mark Forge products, we offer a robust industrial printing platform and control the entire ecosystem from the hardware to the software, even down to the materials that we produce in house. No, this isn't because Mark Forge are control freaks. This integrated platform ensures repeatability, reliability, and the best possible customer outcomes. The question that always comes up is when to print with fiber. So you want to print with fiber when you want your parts to have a, a few different characteristics. Let's talk about those. Number one, metal strength. So, so the strength of a fiber reinforced part comes from the combined strength of the plastic and the continuous fiber strands woven throughout the part. This can make parts comparable to aluminum in strength and stiffness, yet much lighter. So the, the next benefit that we may be looking for is durability. So reinforcing fibers can vastly increase the lifetime of a part. Fibers strengthen that part far beyond traditional plastics, meaning a reinforced part can hold up much better over an extended period of time than a standard plastic part. And then the, the next benefit would be optimized for performance. Our continuous filament fabrication is a unique process in that you can selectively reinforce a part for its use case. You can tailor a part, you can tailor a part strength profile exactly for its application by adding continuous fibers where strength is needed the most. There are a number of benefits for 3D printing with the Metal X versus alternative fabrication methods. So let's, let's take a look at those. The first being no tooling. Many forms of metal fabrication require tooling whether it's casting, bending, extruding, making metal parts also involves, you know, producing hardware that cuts or forms the metal into its final shape. And then three printing parts ultimately require no fixturing or tooling. This allows fabricators to create parts with minimal overhead, decreased part cost for low volume production. In addition, the lack of tooling costs enables business businesses to take new jobs where tooling would have previously proved cost prohibitive. Next, let's, let's talk about automation. Most manufacturing processes require continual human oversight to ensure successful outcomes. For machine components, design must be programmed in CAM before tooling touches stock. Metal 3D printers automatically produce parts from design files. So no CAM is actually necessary. Iger, Mark Forge 3D printing software, produces the file for printing with minimal human input. This helps you get parts in hand faster and more affordably than traditional processes that required skilled labor. And then the obvious, geometric freedom. 
Complexity typically adds cost, lead time, and skilled labor, meaning intricate geometries using subtractive processes are more expensive, time-consuming, and sometimes impossible to machine. With 3D metal printing, complexity is free. With that particular presentation, what we really wanted to highlight for our audience was the ecosystem that Mark Forge actually is. It's a complete system with our, you know, software, our hardware, and our materials all in one place. And that's one of the kind of the, the best features that we find and a lot of our customers find to be very, very helpful when looking for 3D printing in general. Um, and then also to the selectively adding strength, I think the pick and play mentality that you can have with our uh, reinforcement capabilities is another feature that is a differentiator with Mark Forge and one of the best features I think that kind of helps you to um, really utilize your, your particular machine, your, your manufacturing methodology of additive manufacturing across your entire manufacturing floor. And then you can eliminate expensive tooling. So tooling can sometimes be the, the prohibiting factor when it comes to taking on a new project. That tooling can sometimes be so expensive that it doesn't even make it worth your time, your effort, and your money to go after a certain project. So having additive manufacturing in-house to eliminate some of that expensive tooling is one of the biggest takeaways that we found from this particular presentation. What do you guys think? Does the audience have any questions about what they saw today? I think I, think I, I so I, I really enjoyed doing that, that particular presentation and you know, being a technical guy, obviously, like uh, talking about the technical stuff, but I think the biggest takeaways for me um, we're understanding the, the, the ecosystem. So when we talk about Mark Forge, we're talking about, you know, not only the, the printer, but the material, the software, everything is designed for each other and they work so very well together. Um, you know, and, and then when we, when we jump over into metal, that it is readily available, it's a safe, affordable metal technology out there, you know, to, available today. So um, those were, were, were my big takeaways from that presentation. Yeah, my, my, to echo that, my sticking point, you know, when Kyle mentioned, uh, you know, his exact words were, no, Mark Forge isn't, isn't a control freak. And this is something I come across sometimes when, when I'm chatting with someone who's interested in Mark Forge, you know, and, uh, and exploring it. They're like, wait, so you're telling me I got to get all the materials and the software from them. Uh, but you know that they've now coined the uh, the digital forge is kind of uh, the name for the the software, hardware, and materials. Uh, but unless you're like this hardcore techie who can go take this 3D printer, you know, buy a printer, look at look for some third party for your software, find another third party for your materials, and get all this stuff to work together, uh, most of us aren't these hardcore techies that want to modify our printers and, and play with code. Uh, you, you know, it, it's a turnkey solution and uh, you know, I, I think that that's a major sticking point and, uh, you know, why Mark Forge is able to do what they do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just to kind of touch on that selectively adding adding strength, um, you know, we fit into three different categories when it comes to the additive manufacturing. We fit into the prototyping, the jig fixturing and tooling, and then also end use because of that strength capability that we have. So that's kind of one thing that you want to keep in mind when you're looking at additive manufacturing and all the different options in the world. There are endless options out there, but you want to find something that fits into um, a multitude of options when it comes to your application, your manufacturing. We're going to take a look at Mark Forge additive manufacturing post COVID-19. We didn't realize we were overlooking vulnerabilities as much as we tolerate and try to avoid them or work around them. Vulnerabilities in the traditional manufacturing supply chains have always in the past been a very knowable and predictable thing or an acceptable level of risk, if you will. If you want a molded part, you must buy a tool. That tool will cost the market rate um, to be available in about six or eight weeks. And the cost of tooling will be amortized out across the parts. If someone wants a plastic part faster, or the number of parts is too low, additive manufacturing was becoming known as the go-to solution for that weakness. Don't want your IP to get out of the building yet? Well, additive manufacturing. 
want flexibility or the agility to quickly change or iterate the design? Additive manufacturing. Again, the emphasis here is the weaknesses that exist in traditional manufacturing. And additive manufacturing is a really great solution to overcome many of those. But pre-COVID-19, we all assumed that we understood those weaknesses and could predict them all. Let's talk about single supplier concerns, for example, which traditionally only applied to very large companies or the military, where the cost of potential disruption was so high, you would tool up twice or more for the same part just to guarantee no disruptions. What if that supplier just plain fails? Was such a low probability that everyone assumed they could just move production to a shop down the street if a single domino fell? That is what we thought anyway. A perfect example that I spoke with last week is a manufacturer, and he told me that one of their main suppliers when, the, when COVID-19 first happened went on lockdown, or so they thought. But then suddenly, that supplier went completely out of business. This manufacturer was now left scrambling to pick up the pieces, retool, and essentially start over. This manufacturer is currently in a bad spot with no backup capacity at all for those parts, and the few remaining shops that are still around are overloaded right now. Nobody was prepared for this vulnerability because it had never happened before. A traditional predictive ROI on a 3D printer was zero help to that company. Do you do you expect things to turn, return back in one in some shape, some way, shape, or form? Uh, to I, some degree, but I think there's going to, going to be more of a focus on okay, if if this should ever happen again, how do we make sure that we keep going? How do we make sure that we keep people employed? How do we make sure that we keep producing product? If if the whole system should should fall apart again, and I think that might be a push towards uh, additive manufacturing and smaller smaller shops in the same sense that uh, computing isn't done on big mainframes anymore. It's all distributed into a bunch of smaller machines. A Watertown company starting the printing process to help with the shortage of protective gear. Medical professionals say they are running out of the essentials that help keep them safe while treating the sick. The night team's Alex DePrado is live in Watertown to tell us more about what they are doing. Alex? Adam, the company based here in Watertown is 3D printing swabs and also face shields, and they hope the FDA fast tracks the use of both of them uh, for use on patients very soon. Testing for the coronavirus has been limited because of a lack of kits. But the Watertown company, Mark Forged, is trying to change that by 3D printing these swabs. The nice thing about 3D printing is very fast. Right? So they're looking at getting a group of 20 printers and printing 10 to 14,000 swabs a day. Right now, the company is trying to come up with the right design to mimic the ones being used on patients. In, in order to make the swab correct, it has to be flexible enough to kind of go through your nose, but, but not so stiff that it pokes you. In days, Mark Ford says it hopes to have a swab that the FDA approves. The design can then be sent to 3D printers at hospitals and coronavirus test sites around the country. Each swab would cost less than 25 cents to print. The company is also cranking out these shields to protect doctors and nurses working on patients. They're in testing now. So the first, the first batch was dropped off today. The first set of shields are actually being tested at some Boston hospitals. If all goes well, they can go from 3D printer to hospital room in about 10 hours. And the company says they hope to have those shields up and running uh, very soon, as soon as the FDA approves. They won't say what Boston hospitals are testing out the shields, but they do say they cost less than $5 each to print. Live in Watertown, I'm Alex Dobrado, 7 News, 19. So I'm going to take the lead on this one. Uh, can you guys hear me? For some reason, Amelia, we can't hear you. Your, your mic is down. But anyways, let me just give it a second for the... Uh, the slide to come up. I guess I can kick it off. I kind of uh, have the gist. So, I mean, just to give you a little context on this webinar, uh, I think we were we were pretty early in the COVID nineteen game at this point. 
there, there was still a lot of uncertainty. We didn't really know how things were going to unfold. Um, in, in you know, here we are today. I think this was maybe seven seven months ago. I'm going to guess off the top of my head. I don't know the exact date, but uh, I think manufacturing has really demonstrated resiliency. And uh, you know, some people never stopped going to work every day. You know, they couldn't really get into that 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 work from home mode that so many of us went into because they they were essential. And uh, we appreciate everything you did. Uh, so this idea of vulnerabilities of the before and, and during COVID-19. So you know, let's face it, it's not like all of a sudden, uh, you know, there were these new unique challenges that were never faced in manufacturing. So line shutdowns were something that happened before COVID and, uh, and they happened after COVID. But, uh, you know, what we were kind of starting to see in some isolated cases and, uh, and we thought we'd see a lot more of were, uh, you know, kind of like these catastrophic shutdowns because people couldn't get the things that they needed uh, due to COVID. So, so I guess think COVID kind of magnified the problem a little bit, but, um, you know, we were fighting the same fight. I think Kyle kind of captured some of the examples of uh, those sort of supply chain, uh, supply chain uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, yeah, they were present before COVID as well. I don't, so, I mean, what, what were you guys' thoughts on, um, you know, how customers were able to adapt during COVID, you know, not being able to get parts. Yeah, I mean, we had a lot of customers actually pivot um, with their manufacturing. They manu maybe manufactured uh, certain types of packaging materials. I know one of our customers here in Austin, Texas did this, and they ended up having to pivot and do face shields. Um, a lot of our EDUs, because the students were in school, they ended up having to um, utilize their machines for to help supply their local, you know, um, first responders with things. So a lot of organizations really learned how to to, to react according to um, the market with additive manufacturing. It was quite impressive. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess in all of my manufacturing years, I never imagined that we'd be I'd be talking to a customer about, you know, the, the collapse of the global supply chain. You know, we never thought that. You know, it, 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 needing a, a second supplier would, would would ever be a thing. You know, um, it, it was it, it was really crazy. Um, you know, I, I, th I think we all learned a lot. There's lots of uh, lots lots of good takeaways, but mainly that I, th I think we've begun to see that three D printing does allow a customer to pivot very quickly, make adjustments in in a production line or in a product line according to the you know according to the market what what is what is the market driving is the market driving a, a change to your product well you can you can pivot very quickly and, and make a change to your product line and literally just hit print right to, to make some running changes so I, I I think we learned a lot I think it, it drove a lot of a lot of these points home for, for a lot of customers you know, good point. And, you know, and this idea of uh, digitalization and decentralization, I think uh, you know, the fact that we're putting this virtual web event on right now is a testament to that. But, uh, well, you know, as it relates to a technology like MarkForge, you know, uh, the ability to have this uh, part repository, this library of parts, almost like a catalog that uh, could be deployed to different locations, uh, you know, around, around the world or around the U.S., you know, I mean, Kyle, as an engineer, can you maybe speak a little bit to uh, you know, collaborating with different uh, different locations all over the place and, and how Iger, uh, Mark Forge platform, makes that possible? Hey, you know, the, the fantastic thing about the, the cloud-based software is that you do have the ability to, to monitor your fleet, uh, push your jobs to your fleet remotely. Uh, I, I've kicked jobs off in Texas from Europe before. Um, you know, it, there's there's some really neat things that we're going to see coming um, as far as we know there's some large organizations who have made some pretty massive investments in Mark Forge for, for this reason solely to have multiple machines in, the, in areas that they needed in different manufacturing places that allows them to push those jobs to the, the particular spot that needs that, uh, that has the, has the need for the part, right? Yeah. Well, I think you have some th something regarding the software for an update with us later about that. But we're going to move on to the next webinar. Um, and that webinar is going to be the 
how to become an additive manufacturing influencer. Gordon presented this one, so it was a really great one to review. Um, I hope that the majority of you, our audience was able to watch it as well. But other than that, we're going to go ahead and take a look at a couple of clips. Okay, so I think that we've set the stage, given sufficient background to begin to address how do I become an additive manufacturer and influencer? So step one is uh, that you really need to frame it right. And what I mean by that is, you know, ask yourself a simple question. What keeps my boss up at night? And make sure you've, you've done your homework, you've done your research, you know about whatever technology it is that, that you're proposing uh, that your company ultimately uh, acquire. And if you want to be a leader of or, or essentially own the initiative to bring in 3D printing technologies, uh, it, it better address what your, your uh, VP of engineering's main concerns are. So for example, if your VP of engineering is spending 90% of his time concerned with your two largest customers, your proposal to adopt additive technology better address how it's going to better serve uh, or allow your company to better serve those two largest customers. Whatever it is that, that occupies most of your VP of engineering's time, uh, needs to be addressed in the proposition that you grow an additive manufacturing uh, department within your organization. So here's the harsh reality. You know, I guess it's more harsh reality for me than it is for you, but uh, you're going to ask yourself that simple question. Does the data justify a purchase? And my advice here is just be conservative with the numbers. Don't try and inflate anything and make it look better to, to help push a an additive equipment acquisition through. It's only going to hurt you in the long run. If it's something you want to scale and you want to be a true additive leader, you want to start with some composites and then get another composite and get with another metal, inflating the numbers is just going to come back and bite you in the end. It's not even bad practice to add an additional 10 or 15% to your, uh, your materials costs or your operating costs because yeah, there there are some occasional variables that come in. You know, one thing we like to test parts sometimes. If you've got a really geometrically complex feature and you're not sure how it's going to work out on the larger part, you can break that off of the larger part and print just that piece. If it's success, you move forward with the rest of the part. Uh, if it's a failure, then you, you scrap that idea to print that. And so, you know, occasionally you'll go through things and you'll have a, a second iteration here and there, depending. So add some cushion for yourself. And then, um, you know, are there other expenses that I haven't thought about? So, how do you become an additive manufacturing influencer? Um, some of those key points that Jordan touched on, um, the first one was ROI, and that's the biggest one. You obviously want to, when you're taking an opportunity like additive manufacturing to your boss, you want to be able to evaluate all of the all of the factors that he may find as important as maybe you may find. So you want to drive home on the ROI. Um, another option, or I'm sorry, another takeaway that we had was eliminating silos. And what I mean by that is when most organizations that we speak to, um, you know, your R&D department sometimes doesn't communicate well to your QC, to your engineering, and then back and forth between each other. So um, being able to implement something like this to make it to where it really influences and adds value to your entire organization, you want to talk to those different departments um, so that way you can help to um, create a larger ROI for your boss to see the bigger picture. And then one of the biggest takeaways that we want to make sure that we drive home is that MLC CAD Systems is an ally. We're here to help you do all of the things that I mentioned before. Communicate to all the different departments. We're going to help you create that ROI and we're going to help you find as many applications as possible and really get to know your organization along the way to help you understand the bigger picture for here for this whole for, for this whole um, implementation of additive. So, um, Jordan, I know that you you did this presentation. Do you have anything that you'd like to add to this? Here's what I if I could go back and add something new to the, that one, um, it would be. You know, I, there was mention of parts in 2021. I'm making a commitment to not start conversations anymore that are focused on on individual or a couple parts. Uh, for example, like on my way to work today, I was listening to this interview with the manufacturer. I'm gonna have to go back and find this because this guy was actually in Austin, Texas, but he's a big 
he's a big defense contractor and um you know, he was responding to the fact that there's this big push to, uh, you know, the Made in the USA push. You know, so right now, you know, when you get these government contracts, you have to make make these things in the USA, but you're still sourcing components from overseas, and they're trying to up that percentage on the components that need to be, like, assembled to manufacture your end goods in the U.S. if you want to win these government contracts. 80% of this guy's business comes from these government contracts, and he's now in a position where he needs these components that aren't even made in the USA anymore. Like you can't find them. And that's, that is a way, you know, that's a perfect example on how you can start an additive conversation. So we can't come in and say, I guarantee that we can just 3D print these parts that you're getting from overseas. But, but that's like a, a fundamental business problem that this guy's facing that we can sort of lead in and then identify parts. Too many times people are like, you know, oh, here's this, this thingamabob that, that we're making, you know, it's, it's $2 a piece when we order, 10,000 of them, can you 3D print that for cheaper? And a lot of times the answer is no, and you know, that's what I would add, and that's, you know, what I'm thinking. <laughs> we're gonna hope to add. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Yeah. Just, in, just to kind of drive that point home, um, you know, I, I think the, as far as people evaluating or companies evaluating additive manufacturing and, you know, tr trying to justify that to bring it into their business, I think the biggest problem I often see is that people kind of get laser focused on the one application that made them think about additive manufacturing and, and often, I hate to say it, almost have blinders on and they can only see that application and fail to go and look at all the other applications around the company that just make the ROI for that thing so simple. And um, I, I think that the, that's the biggest thing. I. I took away was, hey, you, you need to be looking at other applications, right? There's lots of other things, you know, as I walk through manufacturing plants, I think the biggest groups I always see left behind are, are QC. I don't know why QC always gets left behind, but I, I'm telling you, every time I go talk to the QC guys, they go, oh, God, yeah, we'd love to have have that. Man, it'd make fixturing so easy. You know, that, then we yeah. wouldn't have to use all these two by fours and tire irons to to hold our parts up on our CMM. You know, it's it's good. It's, uh, you know, just look at other applications is, is the thing that I, I always tell people. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, prior to, prior to the situation that we're in where we can't see you guys face to face, we actually, um, you know, having the opportunity to walk your manufacturing floor had, has been in the past very useful because as we're going around, we're pointing out different things that we see that we could possibly help you out along the way. So that's soon to come. We're definitely getting back to that. For sure. Put our masks on and come walk your line any day of the week. See, Jordan had all the props ready. He was ready to go. I like that. <laughs> um, so we're going to move on to our fourth presentation that we're going to review. Um, Mark Forge Design for Additive Manufacturing. Here are our key takeaways. So the first thing I want to talk about is that you have, as designers, as manufacturers, you have a set of manufacturing methodologies already in your brain. Right. And you can look at a design and say that should be blank. Right. So that should be forged. That should be machined. That should be injection molded. And if the part or the design doesn't fit one of those standard ideas, we almost intuitively, our gut just rejects it and says that's a terrible design. You can't do that. Well, I'd like to kind of explore these methodologies and propose adding one more. So let's talk a little bit about each one that we know about. These are not new, but for example, for injection molded parts, uh, you've always got to have draft on the faces, right? It's a design constraint. You want the walls to be uniformly thin so that they're, uh, so that they're basically uh, uh, going to shrink uniformly and work well. Uh, if you have undercuts or any other kinds of uh, slides or anything, the cost is going to go way up in the tooling, which then has to be offset by quantity. And with just a few exceptions where you're maybe doing overmolding, you've got to pick one material and then it's got to be solid, solid throughout. And we just assume that that's just how things work because it is, right? One material, that's what you're going to get. Talk about forging, right? Forging has a lot of similarities with injection molding, uh, where you're going to have to have some draft. 
Uh, but you also got to think about the raw material, right? What's the, the base material and uh, does that need to be maintained or how are you going to form it from the original to the final shape? It's got to have drafted face, it's got to have rounded corners, and fine detail is definitely not something you're going to see in a lot of forgings, or at least a lot of times you don't see that in a forging. With CNC machining, right, you're talking about round internal corners. You're talking about more operations adding cost. You know, if you add operations on multiple faces, that means you're either going to have to chuck it up multiple times, or you're going to have to chuck it up into a more expensive machine like a five axis to get it to run. And you've got to pay attention to stock size and shape, right? If you're going to be removing 80% of the mass in machining operations, then you're going to be spending a lot of money both on material and on time on that machine to get it going. Uh, with welded parts, right, it's got to start with a standard shape and then it's going to work its way through it. The more add, welds you add, uh, the more uh, cost that's going to be added. You've got heat affected zones. The other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of times we think, well, in order to build an efficient part that's strong, we're going to need to use steel. We're going to need to use heavy metals. But if you use composite, you can make a big blocky design that's chock full of carbon fiber that's just as strong as that steel part and requires basically no real effort to perform the design work on, right? So uh, with manufacturing, uh, uh, a lot of these uh, these restrictions and assumptions that are made are really hard to kind of get out uh, from underneath you. Um, so for this one, you know, if you don't assume that the only way to lose weight is by changing the exterior shape, it opens up new possibilities. If you assume that you can use s s uh, softer or lighter materials, you then kind of change how you would even approach it from the beginning. And sparse fill designs are very easy and lightweight to mill, build. The big takeaway I want you to have here is when you're faced with a challenging design, whether it is something that you just can't find a way to make it quickly or reliably, or you can't find it a way to make it cheaply, or you can't make a way to find it where it's strong enough, back up and challenge those design assumptions. 3D printing and additive manufacturing is a really complex and complicated thing, and there's tons of technologies out there. Not all of them are going to be right for you. Some of them are still way too expensive. But if you could eliminate an entire design challenge off your plate and offload it to additive, additive manufacturing, you might just find that this is way closer to our reality or actually kind of a no-brainer more so than you even realized. But you kind of got to get your brain right before you get there. You're not going to accidentally see benefits in additive manufacturing. It's very unlikely that you'll be able to understand it until you understand how it's done or actually go through the process of building one. And so hopefully these examples help you to see how you would approach a design um, with respect to additive manufacturing and uh, uh, hope when you, the, the, the big takeaways, if you see a challenge, when you see a problem, when you see something, you're like, I just don't know how to do it, consider additive manufacturing. And you maybe need to reach out for those first few to the makers of the machines, show them your design challenge, and ask them if they've got anything cool or slick. Uh, and feel free to send anything to me as well. I'm, I'm happy to, to look at a design, look at a challenge, and say, have you thought about doing it this way? And once you can justify it the first time, you're not going to have any problem from there. Everybody that gets a printer says, oh my goodness, this is huge. We don't know how we got by without it. And we now need more for more capacity. It's really amazing to see it happen. But you got to get that first one out the door. So design for additive manufacturing, DFAM. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite subjects. Um, you know, as engineers, we've had this box that we've lived in for, for eons that you know, this bounding box of the, you have to design parts this way because it's the only way they can be manufactured. So, you know, the, there was a bounding box for creating an injection molded part, a sheet metal part, you know, whatever it may be. And so additive manufacturing is breaking those walls down. 
we now have some geometric freedoms that, that we never had before. We're having few of those conversations with the shop floor guys of, you know, as the engineer designs this part and takes it out to the shop, you know, that there was always a conversation before of, hey, Mr. Engineer, you can't build this, right? It's, it's a cool design, but it just, you can't build it via traditional methods. So now additive is, is obviously, you know, we're breaking those down and, and that's, that's a, you know, fantastic feature, you know, but it also opens up things um, like, like light weighting. So, it, you know, for eons, we designed a parts light weighting, you know, you punched holes in it or designed some, some geometries that were expensive to make, trying to make a part lighter. But now in additive manufacturing where the sparse fill in both the composites and the metal, uh, you, you really are, do have the ability to build a, a very lightweight part that's as functional as, as a solid part. Um, you know, in, in, uh, yeah. So, uh, do, do you guys, what, what did you guys think, uh, you know, what less, what's the less technical takeaway on the design for additive manufacturing side? Yeah. Well, it, it's like you said in your, your second key takeaway, the successful customers are using the BAM. Um, one thing that I, I had to wrap my head around cause I'm not an engineer is that in order for you to utilize the technology properly, efficiently, and effectively, you really have to know how to design for your technology. And so we do have design guides for both the composite and the metal that help customers kind of understand how to utilize our technology to its fullest capacity. Um, you know, and then one step further with the whole ecosystem that we talked about earlier is that they do have Mark Forged University and because we've had to pivot on this, you know, web-based 2020 COVID-19, um, you know, let's make do with what we've got mentality, they have now um, put forth uh, the efforts into putting a composite and a metal certification together for Mark Forged University. So uh, just another thing to add to the many list uh, items of uniqueness with Mark Forged is the Mark Forge University capabilities. So that's kind of a cool factor if you guys weren't aware of it before. I, my take is that, um, you know, don't let, I think that I've, I've had people come to me in the past that are intimidated by DFAM, but don't let it be an obstacle because, uh, you know, it, it's more, anytime, you know, I've talked to VPs of engineering that they're intimidated by change. You know, let's say, that they see value in additive, but the fact of taking on a new task and uh, and failing is you know something that makes them put off adopting additive manufacturing. You know, for example, it's like let's say some some new regulation or compliance law uh, takes place, and a VP of engineering is uh, you know by necessity has to purchase this piece of software that, that they don't even know if they're going to be able to implement. Uh, and then I want to have a conversation about additive manufacturing. They look at DFAM as something, you know, that, that could potentially cause their failure. You know, I think an easy place to start would be um, a design guide. You know, Mark Forge is a very simple design guide that could go watch through some of the principles that Marcus went through in that webinar. Uh, that it just, you know, helps you with some tips and tricks. They're going to be able to repeat over and over again as you start uh, printing more parts. And then uh, sort of like Amelia mentioned earlier, and this ties back to that earlier webinar where uh, you know, Kyle was saying they're not control freaks, they just want to make you successful with it. And that's where Mark Forge University plays in. So you know, here, here's the, the software that you need, here's the printer that you need, uh, here's all the materials. We know you can have a great result with this. And now here's the curriculum that's based specifically on Mark Forge technology uh, that's going to take you there. And, and DFAM is definitely part of that. Um, you know, I've seen Kyle answering DFAM questions at 10 o'clock at night. MLC is going to basically help you until you've exhausted all of our options. And then, you know, you sort of get escalated to, to Mark Forge until the problem is solved. Hey, so yeah. I'm going to I'm going to jump in here real quick. I think one last thing I, I definitely want to note about DFAM is that I, I, our customers that are having the highest level, highest degree of success with additive manufacturing are those who have who have adopted the thought process of DFAM and have implemented that into their business. Because just because you designed a part to be machine, that doesn't mean that uh, that doesn't mean that it should should be printed that way, right? O often some small subtle changes can optimize it for additive manufacturing and um, 
you, you know, ultimately it, it, it often brings the question just because I can print it, should I print it? Right. right. So with, with that, right. I, I think well, let's, we can, let's we move on. definitely talk yeah. all day about DFAM. I know I can. But the reality is we got one more webinar for you guys, and this is the most important one, so I want everyone to pay attention. This is the Mark Forged Metal X webinar hosted by Marcus Brown. A lot of these questions are coming from our YouTube channel. So we built a video called, uh, you know, the Mark Forge Metal X is here. I'll, I'll put a link in the comments at the end of the webinar. And we had 100,000 people view that video and put in all kinds of comments. And they were very eye-opening for us because there were things that we did not do a great job of explaining or that just simply weren't as intuitive for somebody coming in from the outside. So we're going to use that to kind of guide our commonly asked questions. I think the reason there were so many questions is that this process is very unfamiliar to a lot of people. Not a lot of people are, are, are uh, aware, exposed to the centering process. Uh, a lot of times people aren't even really familiar with additive manufacturing, or if they are, they think of it more as, you know, printing toys or printing conceptual, you know, prototypes for like trade shows, not for printing parts that are going to be full production, full strength parts. Centering seems like a bit magical, so we'll talk a little bit more detail about what goes on in the oven during the centering process and what that has, uh, impact that has on your finished parts. Uh, but a lot of times people just simply think it's either too simple or too complex. It's kind of interesting from comment to comment, people will say, wow, that's awesome, that's really cool, or no, that's way too many steps, right? Uh, so we're here to kind of help with that skepticism, that healthy skepticism, and build some trust. So you can see that this is not magic. This is not futures. This is a great machine uh, that may be a really fantastic situation for your company. The first thing a lot of people freak out about is the cloud. And understandably, there's other scenarios where people have implemented the cloud in certain ways that have not been ideal. Because cost is an important factor, and we do not buy these machines because they're fun. We buy them because they make us money, because we need them for our jobs to be able to be profitable and, you know, compete in the, the marketing of the landscape. So here's a couple terrible ideas just to kind of kick off the ROI discussion. Not to make fun of anybody who thought this, but basically... One thing that some people sort of think of is, well, wait a minute, I can't just throw away my machines, my lathe, my mill, and my laser just because I bought a Metal X. And in fact, we don't want you to do that. Don't do that. Don't expect to do that. This is not a replacement for production. Do not expect this to replace normal production. This is not a high volume process. Right? This is not going to be great if you've got a lot of things that need to be done over and over again. We'll talk about the quantity ROI in a minute. And don't expect this to be the number one thing you use to build your parts. In other words, don't, don't just, you know, a lot of times round parts, you put them on the lathe by default because that's what you do with all your parts. And you just assume any round part is going to be put on the lathe because that's where everything goes. Don't treat the Metal X like your lathe. Don't put every part on the Metal X just because it can be put on there. Right? You really got to kind of think this through. Let's talk about what this looks like and what kind of parts you'd want to look for in order to decide whether the Metal X is for you. Because honestly, the Metal X is not for everybody. That was a, I, you know, I, I loved that presentation because, gosh, we had so many views and, you know, outside of the standard uh, internet trolls, uh, there was lots of uh, lots of really good questions and, and comments. And you know, it, it is a new process when when we really think about the the Metal X technology. You know, that really was only publicly available till late two thousand eighteen. So so it's, so it's, it's new. Um, you know, but people have been scared about the shrink. I get that. I, I love to use the term auto magic. So our software scales your part and it's auto magic. When you, when you pull it in, it just works, right? It, it just, it just works. So that that's really what we drive home. Um, and, and I'm going to talk more about the software here in, in, in a few minutes. Um, but ultimately, um, our, our, our software is highly secure, uh, highly dependable. 
uh, there's in five years been uh, one outage. Uh, so that, that's pretty incredible. Um, to, to drive a, another thing home that, that Marcus said that, that I think really, really hit me. And, and it's funny how often I, d I do get this question. Hey, you know, I could, I could just print all my nuts and bolts. And again, so it, it brings up that statement I made on the last one. Just because I can print it, should I print it? You know, no, often anything you can get off the shelf, you, you, you don't want to print. It's typically not, not a good use of, of, of your equipment. And again, the, the Metal X in composite for, for that matter is not here to replace your, your CNC mills, your laves, your lasers, anything like that. It's here to support those. And ultimately we want you to, to view these as like a, a tool in the toolbox to support those machines, make them more effective and more efficient. Um, th those are, those were my takeaways from, from, from that one outside of all the fun comments. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, we're really excited about the Metal X. We have been excited about the Metal X um, for a number of years now with the number of opportunity of, you know, alloys that we have available. Uh, you don't have to switch out your machine to utilize all the different materials across the board, though we see it being um, something that a lot of our customers are going to be implementing in 2021. So don't hesitate to obviously reach out to us and, and talk to us more about the metal system. We can compare it with you. Um, we, we would love to do that. But the key takeaways, like Kyle said, are, you know, we're not here to replace anything that you're doing in-house. We're here to enhance it and make it better. I want to add to, um, and I don't know if this may have been presented and just not highlighted as a, a best moment from that webinar, but just, you know, the combination of using a composite printer with your metal printer. And we certainly, I could have brought this point up when we talked about DFAM, but but those hybrid parts, you know, where you need the strength of metal, use the metal, and uh, you can definitely can incorporate parts. Uh, you know, I, I've seen our application team as masters of embedding, you know, nuts and hex rods, and uh, you know, your imagination's unlimited. I guess the more that you understand the principles of DFAM, uh, the the better you'll get at, at making those hybrid parts and um, you know, incorporating both technologies. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Step in on exactly, but <laughs> I just want—I awesome. wanted to get some folks in there anywhere I could. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started on the updates that we have for 2021. This is why I know majority of you kind of came to see the presentation today. Um, we're going to take a look at a market review. Jordan's going to handle that for us. Um, Jordan, what do you got to say about the 2020 market with additive manufacturing? Um, yeah, we can switch to the next slide. There's just some images to, to kind of go with it. So yeah, I think that uh, the future looks very promising for additive manufacturing as a whole. Uh, you know, Mark Ford specifically is doing some very big things. Uh, we're living in an $80 trillion economy. Uh, $13 trillion of that $80 trillion is in manufacturing. As of right now, uh, additive manufacturing is 0.1% of, of manufacturing. Uh, you know, so we can see by, uh, by the year 2030 that we're looking at you know, 11 times larger additive manufacturing. So, you know, I mean, pay, pay attention, get in early. You know, I guess the, uh, the sort of parallels that, not even early, because it's, it's not early anymore, but the, the parallels that we look at are you know, the, the computer, uh, you know, it doesn't just happen like that. It took a little time for people to adopt the personal computer. The VP of marketing at Mark Forge likes to talk about the, the, the steam engine converting over to the combustion engine over a period of time. Uh, we're a company located primarily in the South. Uh, so I wanted to turn to the example of uh, horses and mules converted over to, to tractors. Uh, I mean, I think we can all acknowledge that using a tractor on a farm is a lot more efficient than uh, than, than you know having your your uh, you know dozen or so horses and mules. Uh, but but not to say it's you know if that's the way you've been doing it for a long time. It's only natural that people are going to be really emotionally attached uh, to the way that things have uh, been done. But you know now if we're starting a farm, we wouldn't think twice about uh, yeah. buying a couple tractors. You know, I guess the only difference between these models when you look at things like, you know, changing over steam, steam to combustion, uh, horses and mules to uh, tractors, is we're looking at like one to one. The, the confusing thing with additive, I don't think that we're displacing one specific technology. I think that it's going to be a number of them. 
because I think that instead of just being like uh, mules and horses, you're going to have uh, you know casting on there, machining, uh, forging, uh, I'm trying to crappy 3D printing technology that yields terrible parts. <laughs> so I think we're going to be displacing a lot of different technologies as we see you know enterprise grade 3D yeah. printing. Uh, well, Jordan, I don't mean to cut you off. I know you love that topic. Um, we're almost at the end of our presentation. Uh, so folks, hold on just a little bit longer. Um, we hope to not take too much more of your time. We definitely want to do a Q&A at the end. But we're going to do a wrap up with, with Kyle taking a look at 2020, 2021 updates with Mark Gorge. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, you know, there's there's lots of new and exciting things, and and so we just um, all, all of the Mark Forgery sellers just came off the uh, Global Partner Summit, so we got to hear all, all the new and good things, and and um, it it sort of stinks that there's a lot of stuff that I can't talk about. There's there's lots of new things. I, I you know, well, m my biggest thing I have to say here is everybody hide and watch. There's lots of neat things coming. Um, you know, when we look at the history of Mark Forge, Mark Forge has had a had a history of making things bigger, making things faster, uh, in and innovating with materials. You know, and and with with that said, you know, and at the same time, making them more, more accurate while they improve the, the size and speed. So, with that, you know, let's let's dream with with that in mind. Um, you know. What I really want to point out is there were some really robust things that happened at the end of the year that it, that we're just now beginning to see the effects of. You know, anybody who has a Mark Forge machine now saw the things that that rolled out close to the end of the year, like consumable tracking. So gone is the day that you have to remember, hey, I changed this Bowden tube, um, you know, so many hours ago, and I think it has oh about X amount of hours on it, and it's time to change it. Now the machine tracks it for you. It it tracks that. It it tracks uh, Bowden tubes, nozzles, materials. Um, there's there's lots of stuff that it's now taking care of. And and at the same time, I don't know if ever anybody even realizes this. That just imagine this for a moment. Everybody who has a Mark II, the print volume increased last year. Mark IVs made the print volume made it print closer to the edge of the of the um, uh, of the print table, so th that's who does that. N nobody's done that, and 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 it goes to how Mark Forge has built such a robust platform that's and they're really thinking about the future. That as these changes roll out, they just happen for us. That they're, they're good. Um, the uh, as far as materials, ESD came out for us the last the end of last year. I contact us. We got ESD in the stock. Let's talk about the, those applications. There's lots of fun stuff, and we're we're super excited about that material. And then, if you haven't heard about FR, you, you know your flame retardant material. You're talking about a material that meets all the FA and UL requirements for self extinguishing material. There's some neat stuff coming, and some some um, aviation associated announcements coming for for that material. So. So that that is super exciting, and then finally, the one thing I do want to, want we we've got to talk about is Iger, our software. Uh, yeah, it's cloud based. We have a enterprise version coming out very very soon, and there's going to be multiple versions of that. Uh, can't really talk about the the versions that we're going to have, but if if uh, um, if one of those is applicable to you, definitely reach out to us. Uh, we'll be reaching out to the customers that that is really going to benefit. There's some really neat features. Just bearing in mind that we are the only 3D printer slicer or 3D printer manufacturer out there that has a software that's 27,001 ISO certified. Basically, you know, when we break that down to to simplistic terms, we're talking about US DoD encryption. So your encryption at rest. Um, you know, nobody, nobody's doing that. Uh, so well, what we're proving is we're highly secure, uh, we're highly dependable, and, um, you know, we're, we're, we're the wave of the future for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kyle, for that recap.